Hello and welcome to this talk on Doppler and color flow imaging in the ultrasound machine. We'll start with the Doppler techniques and we'll, we have to start a bit further away from that. We know that there's blood flow inside your heart and in your blood vessels. However, all the rules and, and physics um, that govern this blood flow were derived from uniform liquids in a rigid pipe and those equations and those physics principles were somehow applied to blood flow in your body and we know that blood flow is blood is not a uniform liquid there's liquid in it and there's the cellular compartments in it as well it is in a pulsatile fashion we know that the vessel walls are not rigid they are elastic so um, blood flow determinants would be the type of vessel and the size of vessel you will have some resistance to that flow uh, depends which phase of the cardiac cycle you're in and if there's any pathology involved or not so flow can be measured uh, with the ultrasound machine and once we know uh, some flow characteristics um, especially velocity of that flow we can use that to calculate some intracavitary pressures or intravascular pressures which is very important in the way of um, medical assessment and this is why measuring flow is important also to assess flow in terms of cardiac output so it can be very important or it is very important in the um, critical care arena we'll come back to these equations a lot in in future lectures so this is the um, the modified Bernoulli equations so you will come back to this and we'll explain this much more in detail so for the moment I'm just telling you that velocity of flow can be used to calculate pressure inside a chamber or inside a blood vessel and to measure that velocity we use the Doppler effect Doppler effect was um, discovered by Christian Doppler who was an Austrian uh, mathematician and he noticed that the frequency of sound changes depending on whether the sound source or the listening uh, person is stationary or moving so the frequency of sound is unchanged if the sound source is stationary however if the sound source is moving in one direction uh, the frequency of perceived sound will change if you're moving away from your listener then the frequency will drop so you have a lower pitch and if you move towards uh, the listener then frequency will go up and you get a higher pitch so I know everyone knows the example when the ambulance with the siren comes towards you and then goes away from you so coming towards you uh, you're getting higher and higher pitch it means that the frequency will go up that's coming towards you and then when it passed you and then it goes away from you you're getting lower and lower pitch it means that the frequency will drop so this is uh, the Doppler effect changing frequency in terms of moving either sound source or a moving uh, object and the Doppler shift is the next important concept that we have to uh, understand so here the sound source is stationary so there's no movement in either direction it means that as the sound is emitted and then you're getting returning echoes 
from that sound source, the frequency of the emitted sound and the returning sound will be the same. There is no Doppler shift in this occasion. If your sound source is coming towards you, then it means that your ultrasound waves or sound waves will be compressed. You're going to get a higher frequency and at the same time a lower wavelength. So the Doppler shift will be positive. It means that the, uh, the returning sound frequency will be higher than the transmitted one. And the opposite is true if the direction is towards the other way. So when the sound source is moving away from you, the returning echoes will get a lower frequency, meaning you know, lower pitch, and that's a negative Doppler shift. So it means that you're moving away uh, from the probe. So that is the basis of any ultrasound machine. And the ultrasound machine is looking for this Doppler shift. And the ultrasound machine will detect this Doppler shift and it will use the actual Doppler shift to calculate velocity. How does it do that? First of all, if there is a Doppler shift, then the ultrasound machine knows that there is flow. So that's the presence and absence of flow. From the direction of that Doppler shift, positive Doppler shift versus negative Doppler shift, the ultrasound machine can decide whether that flow is going towards or away from the probe. The degree of Doppler shift you get, uh, you can infer the velocity of that flow. And then how uniform uh, those returning Doppler shifts are. Um, if it's a laminar flow versus turbulent flow, you can tell from the returning Doppler shifts that as well. So the ultrasound machine can determine all of the above just by listening to these uh, Doppler shifts and just using these Doppler shifts to calculate all of the above. How do we do that? How does the ultrasound machine do that? So first of all, pay attention to the left side of this image. Uh, equation A we're going to be describing first. I have placed this up here as well. So the Doppler shift or the change in frequency where you have a positive shift when you're going towards and you have a negative shift when you're going away. Uh, so this is the basis of that uh, frequency change. So that's your Doppler shift. And the Doppler shift as depicted here is calculated using this equation uh, as you see. So twice the original transducer frequency times the velocity of flow and that's over speed of sound in that particular tissue in that particular medium multiplied by cosine theta and that theta is the angle of insonation. For the moment it's enough to say that the blood flow velocity is in one direction and the ultrasound beam can be exactly uh, parallel to that direction or you may be interrogating that flow from the side and this angle will be the th theta so how well you're aligned with the direction of flow very important because you're introducing the cosine of this angle into the equation, meaning that if you're not exactly parallel, you're going to have an underestimation of that flow. OK, so let's move through the equation just one more time because this is quite important. And this is the equation that is used by the ultrasound machine. So the Doppler shift equals twice the transmitter frequency or the transducer frequency times the flow velocity 
over the speed of sound in tissues multiplied by the cosine of that incident angle. Speed of sound in tissue, as you heard in previous lectures, is assumed to be 1540 meters per sec. The transducer frequency will be in hertz, the velocity in meters per sec. So then you can uh, put all of that or plug it in into that equation and calculate the Doppler shift. We'll move to the right side of the image. So the B equation now. And you see just rearranging equation A, you can actually calculate the flow velocity uh, from equation A. So if you rearrange this whole equation and you want to know what is the velocity of that flow, then you have your speed of sound in tissue, again, which is 1540 meters per sec. You have your Doppler shift here, which is measured by the ultrasound machine. You have your transducer frequency there, which we know. And then you multiply the whole thing by the cosine of that angle theta. So this is how the ultrasound machine calculates the velocity. And this velocity will be displayed on your screen. So th this is how the ultrasound machine works. Listening to that Doppler shift, detecting that Doppler shift, plugging in all these numbers into the equation and then getting the velocity and then it will be transferred into a, into a, a picture or wh whichever way you're looking at it, either a number you get or a color or a, or a graph. So this is how velocity will be depicted on your screen, the ultrasound machine screen. And as you see, um, the greater the Doppler shift, the higher the velocity. So that's, that's a base um, statement on, on all uh, velocity measurements. Why is, that in, why is the incident angle so important? So I already showed you a little bit what happens so here, as you see, the direction of flow is, in, is exactly parallel to that ultrasound beam. So in this case, the measurement, the Doppler shift, will be, um, will be measured accurately. So then when you plug in all those numbers, you're going to get the true velocity when you're exactly lined up with the flow ultrasound beam and flow are exactly parallel. However, when, when the flow direction is not exactly parallel to your ultrasound beam, you're introducing this angle. And you can imagine that the returning echoes, if they're not exactly parallel, they're going to be different. So the returning Doppler shift will be different. So that's why uh, the, the theta and the cosine of that theta angle will be introduced into this equation. And physics, again, I'm not very good at it, but the cosine of zero is one. So when there is no angle between uh, the two directions, you're introducing no error into the equation. So cosine of zero is one. And the cosine of 90 degrees is uh, zero. So if, if you think about it, so if you wanted to interrogate the flow and your ultrasound beam is exactly 90 degrees onto that direction, then you will not get any measurement at all because cosine 90 will be zero. So you're introducing a 100% error into that equation. And anywhere between 0 and 90 degrees, you'll get more and more error introduced into your equation. And as a rough guide, we recommend that the ultrasound beam 
and the direction of blood flow should be within about 20 degrees within each other from each other so with that you're introducing about six percent error into your Doppler equation Doppler shift equation and velocity uh, measurement velocity equation and that's kind of acceptable still the less the better but definitely no more than 20 degrees is recommended if you think you're more than 20 degrees away from that pro from from that um, velocity direction then you'll have to find another view another window or another way of measuring that flow and i put it here down at the bottom that um, angle correction is not recommended in, in many ultrasound machine systems there is this angle correction feature where you can kind of change the direction of the cursor line the, the direction of that um, uh, Doppler line and then the ultrasound machine will calculate the flow velocity based on that angle correction however in textbooks are not recommending using these angle corrections because these flows are very often three-dimensional in nature they these jets uh, would be very very hard to interrogate and you're inferring uh, you're trying to introduce this angle correction and you 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 might not know which direction you should be using it and you may be introducing still some error into the equation so all in all angle correction is not recommended by textbooks all right so let's again have a look at the doppler equation and the doppler shift and as you see uh, the initial transducer frequency is very much important in this Doppler shift. So the, the transducer and the frequency of the transducer will be very important in the way of um, detecting the Doppler shift. The higher the transducer de uh, frequency, the higher the Doppler shift will be. And later on this will become important when we'll be talking about um, image optimization. And the other part of the equation uh, where I showed you how we can rearrange it and come to that velocity measurement. So we use this velocity to determine pressure gradients inside the heart or inside blood vessels. And again, without getting into this more uh, deeper into this right now, this is the modified Bernoulli equation and I'll be coming back to this in later lectures and then we'll be talking about this a lot in future lectures. For now it's enough that we're using flow and velocity measurements to infer pressures and pressure gradients inside the heart. So all in all, measuring this Doppler shift is used by various modalities inside the ultrasound machine. So you can use it for spectral Doppler, which is a graph. So you're using that information, that measurement of the Doppler shift will be depicted as a graph. Or you can use it to, um, you, to, to make colorful depiction of flows. So spectral Doppler and color Doppler they all based on the same Doppler principle and the same Doppler shift measurements. Within spectral Doppler, we distinguish between the pulsed wave Doppler, continuous wave Doppler, and then uh, tissue Doppler imaging is really another way of using pulsed wave Doppler. And then you'll see later that actually the color flow Doppler is using the pulsed wave Doppler principles as well. So really, if you're looking at the, the modalities, there's only two main Doppler modalities. You have your pulsed wave Doppler and then you have your continuous wave Doppler. And then it, it really is just how you display the information. That's the difference.
From the spectral Doppler display, you have a lot of information that you can detect. You have the velocity of the flow, as I mentioned before, the direction of the flow that comes whether the Doppler shift was positive or negative. You have the intensity or amplitude of signals, so how many red cells are traveling in the same direction. So if, if you have a, a strong flow with a lot of red cells traveling in the same direction, you have a very high intensity signal. So a lot of Doppler shifts coming back at the same uh, number. So then it's going to be a much stronger signal coming back. If there's less red cells traveling in that same direction, you'll see that the intensity of that signal will be lower. You can have some information on timing of events. I mentioned before that some information you can infer uh, whether the flow is laminar or turbulent. And then really all these Doppler shifts are in the audible range. So that's what you're listening to. That's what the ultrasound machine is producing for you. So you're listening to the actual Doppler shift. And it, that's, is it, that, that's in your audible range. So it's audible for humans uh, in the kilohertz range, roughly. So you'll see that um, the, this, this soft whooshing sound, that's usually a laminar flow. If it's turbulent, then it's much higher pitch and somehow it, it's more jumbled and, and it, it really sounds different. So you can infer some information just even by listening to these audible signals produced by the ultrasound machine. And this is a, a spectral display. So for the moment, uh, I'll just introduce a few properties or this, some features of this spectral display. The baseline is really um, dividing the screen into two different portions. Above the baseline usually tells you that it's flow towards you, so that's information on the direction of the flow. Below the baseline, that's direction away from you, that's flow away from you. You get information on uh, where you measuring the flow. I'll come back to this later. You're also getting information on the velocity, how fast that flow is, and the scale is important as well. So please pay attention uh, what sort of units you're getting there. So this is flow in meters per sec. Usually blood flow is in the meters per sec range. And then with the numbers there, you'll see that um, the velocity will be higher or lower according to those numbers. You're getting information in terms of time as well, what's happening when. Um, and then you can relate timing to the phases of the cardiac cycle from the ECG. So all this is very important information to us. Let's start with the pulsed wave Doppler. So both of these are pulsed wave Doppler displays, spectral displays. I'll start with spectral envelope. So this is the whole picture here. That's your spectral envelope. If you have a nice, clear, crisp image, the modal velocity which is this outermost white image or line. So that's your model velocity. If that's nice and narrow, it means that all those velocities are quite uniform in nature. So from, for example, in the upper image, you have the velocities from the abdominal aorta. However, if you think about this term here, the, the spectral broadening. And the bottom side, bottom image, the pulsed wave spectral envelope is there. And the modal velocity is really blurred. And you see how 
the model velocity is very much broadened. So it means that you were measuring very different velocities and all that is adding up. Another important bit that relates to the spectral display and the spectral envelope is the spectral window. And again, if you have a nice, clear, crisp image, the spectral window will be large and the, it's going to be all dark and, and there'll, there'll, be a, there'll be a scooped out appearance of that um, spectral display. However, when, the, uh, the, when there's significant spectral broadening, like here in the bottom image, the spectral window will be much smaller as well. Spectral broadening occurs where there's some turbulent flow, so it can signify that there is turbulent flow happening, or your sample volume might be too large so that you're, uh, you're trying to measure the flow in a wider area as opposed to a short, smaller sample volume. So you're, you were looking at flows all of happening in this area versus flow happening in the smaller area. So that might be a reason why your spectral broadening is happening. Continuous wave Doppler. Same things can be inferred from uh, the spectral display. The spectral envelope, as explained earlier, and as you see here, there is no spectral window. There's no modal velocity. The continuous wave Doppler is measuring flows all the way across your cursor line. So it means that you're getting flow information all the way across this line, and it's all put together inside this spectral envelope. So that's why there's so many different velocities and that's why there's no spectral window and there's no modal velocity because there's so many different velocities. So there is spectral broadening even with laminar flow and that's the reason behind it because you're measuring flows along a long line. But from the display you can get exactly the same information though uh, about the velocity. Is it coming towards you or is it going away from you? The direction of flow and the, and the, the, uh, the actual uh, velocity, which is higher or lower velocities in either direction. The intensity is an important bit. So if you compare, for example, the flows in this pulmonary artery measurement. See how the flow away from the probe, it's very white and very uniform and very bright and white. And it, this one is much stronger if you compare it with this uh, pulmonary regurgitant jet flow. This one is kind of much less white and, and it's not even a full um, signal. So you see that you can tell whether that flow is stronger or less strong. So intensity is very much a feature in, in the continuous wave uh, display. And again, timing, which is important. So using ECG, you can check what's happening along the cardiac cycle. A third modality which is using pulsed wave principles, we'll be talking about this later a little more, is the tissue Doppler imaging, where you're checking how velocity is inside the tissue, so cardiac tissue. So this time you're not looking at cavities, not looking at blood flows, but you're looking at tissue so cardiac tissue, which is muscle, and how the velocity is in that tissue. And since this is again a, a spectral Doppler display using pulsed wave Doppler, you're getting the same information again. So you're getting the velocity, but I'd like to point your attention this time, this is in centimeters per sec. 
So that's why it's important to really pay attention what sort of units are used in your spectral Doppler display. Direction of flow, uh, direction of movement, rather. So when it's moving away from you or towards you. Intensity, so you're getting a nice modal velocity. And then timing with uh, the phases of the cardiac cycle. And you have the same display, so our, this is based on the pulsed wave Doppler. So you have a, a scooped out spectral envelope with your spectral window in the middle. And then you may get some spectral broadening from this as well. That means that you need to find a better quality image or a better alignment. And um, I, I, I just wanted to mention that tissue Doppler imaging is much more robust though than uh, the pulsed wave Doppler for uh, flow velocities. So this is much more forgiving and you might get good information even with less good quality images. So if we move on and we're trying to compare pulse wave Doppler with continuous wave Doppler, one big difference is that as you see here from the uh, from the picture, the pulsed wave Doppler will check for that velocity in one specific location in the LVOT, whereas the continuous wave Doppler will do the velocities all across this cursor line. So you're getting information anywhere and everywhere along this line but you don't know where it's coming from. Pulsed wave Doppler, on the other hand, you know exactly where the information is coming from because you set your sample volume in that location. So that is one major difference between these two modalities. And let's walk through the main differences a little more in detail. Is there depth resolution between the two? Pulsed wave Doppler, yes. So you, you are setting your sample volume where you want it to be, meaning that your measuring velocity is in that exact location. There is no depth resolution in continuous wave Doppler, as I mentioned, as you're measuring everything along that line. This is called range ambiguity as well. Can you measure high velocities with pulsed wave Doppler? No, unfortunately no, because pulsed wave Doppler techniques are prone to aliasing. I will explain this a lot more in detail over the next few slides. But as a, as to, just to continue the comparison, continuous wave Doppler is able to measure very high velocities. So when you're expecting or suspecting high velocities, you need to be using continuous wave Doppler because continuous wave Doppler techniques are not prone to aliasing. And then transducer power is more um, related to uh, the bioeffects of uh, ultrasound, thermal and mechanical effects. You'll hear about this in another lecture. So let's start with the continuous wave Doppler because this one is, is an easier modality. Continuous wave Doppler is continuously transmitting and continuously receiving. How does it look like? You have your ultrasound probe and you have your piezoelectric crystals in that ultrasound probe and some of these piezo pio piezoelectric crystals are assigned for transmitting and the others are, are assigned for receiving. So some of these crystals will be continuously transmit and the others will be continuously receive. So that's the basis of content and that's why it's called continuous wave Doppler. 
And because it's continuously measuring returning Doppler shifts and continuously emitting and continuously listening to returning signals, it will be able to detect high Doppler shifts, meaning it will be able to detect high velocities. So there is no um, limit in how high velocities you can measure with the continuous wave Doppler. But again, uh, as I mentioned, range ambiguity is a feature of continuous wave Doppler, meaning that you don't know where those returning signals are coming from, because they are coming from the whole entire length of your ultrasound beam. So we just don't know where exactly which depth they were returning from. And that's just a property of continuous wave techniques. And if you think back to the previous physics lecture, this is how the continuous wave technique looks like. So over a one second period, you're going to have a, some piezoelectric crystals continuously emitting for the whole one second. And other piezo piezoelectric crystals will be continuously receiving the returning echoes. So then from that, it follows that the duty factor of a continuous wave technique will be one. The pulse duration is one second out of one second, and then the returning echoes, the listening time, is again one second out of one second, so that the duty factor will be one in this way. If we move on to pulsed wave Doppler, though, Pulsed wave Doppler is using short bursts of signals. So you're using uh, the same method really what is used for 2D imaging. And I'll be, I'll be referring back to uh, the previous lecture on this. However, you control where you put your sample volume. So when you drop your Doppler line, you control which depth you're going to put your sample volume, and then you know exactly where the returning information is coming from. So you control where you want to have the information from. That's a good advantage of the pulsed wave Doppler. However, this becomes a disadvantage as well at the same time. Pulse wave Doppler is using short bursts of ultrasound. And we explained this earlier in the earlier talk. You have your pulse duration and then you have your pulse repetition free, uh, period. And this will determine the pulse repetition frequency as well. 2D imaging uses the same principle. So 2D imaging will use the same short bursts of pulses. And pulsed wave Doppler, as the name implies, uses the same technique as well. The duty factor for 2D imaging will be uh, about 0.1%. And the duty factor for pulsed wave Doppler will be about 1%. So 1% of the time is spent with emitting and 99% of the time is spent with listening for returning echoes. So what does it look like? I show you how an ultrasound image is formed. So you have a scan line and then all these scan lines are put together for your 2D image. Very similar what happens with the pulsed wave. However, in this, in this occasion, you only have one scan line. You place it somewhere along your sector and you only have this one scan line and then the ultrasound pulse is, is emitted from the probe. It's going to reach your sample volume depth. The returning echoes are traveling backwards and then as soon as they reached the um, transducer, the next pulse will be emitted. So it's always assumed that any returning echoes are coming from that immediate prior uh, pulse. And that can be a problem. 
as you, we will see in the next uh, couple of slides. So again, I'd like to refer back the importance of depth. It always takes time to reach that depth and then to come for the returning echoes to come back to the probe. So depth is, is a very important determinant on how long it takes for these echoes to return to your probe. And depth is also a very important determinant of your pulse repetition frequency because you just need enough time for those echoes to return back um, to your ultrasound probe. Since the velocity of ultrasound in tissues is 15, 40 meters per sec, so that's a given, um, really the pulse repetition frequency will be determined by imaging depth. And the sampling rate is determined by pulse repetition frequency. I'll show you this uh, over the next few slides. And then as you see, pulse repetition frequency is determined by your pulse repetition period. And that is again governed by how deep you're gonna place your sample volume. There, there's a much more detailed explanation of this in the previous talk on ultrasound physics. And when you start your pulsed wave imaging, sometimes you find that the ultrasound machine will give you real funny images and, and strange looking images. So as you see here, there's flow away from the probe and then there's this bit up here at the same time towards the flow, to towards the probe as well, which obviously cannot happen. So same inform so this information is, is really not depicted uh, in a correct way. So this is obviously a, an, an erroneous image coming from the ultrasound machine. But why is this happening? If you look at little video. See how the propeller is moving forwards and then the backwards. And this is called alias, where you just don't know which direction you're going, or is it coming or is it going. Let me explain it in another way. If you think about these arrows as a clock phase, so first it's 12 o'clock and then it's moving to 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock. So there is a clockwise progression of these arrows. So there is a clockwise progression of, of these arrows. Depending on how often you're sampling these arrows, you, know, you, you, you may or may not know what is actually happening. So if you're sampling them uh, every quarter, so you, you're going to know exactly which direction you're going. You're going to know that there is a, a, a clockwise direction of this flow. However, if you're sampling uh, the clock face every second arrow, then you, you have a up and down and up and down, but you just don't know which direction they went. So this is ambiguous. So it can be either way, really. Or if you're sampling these arrows even less frequently, um, so let's say every, every fourth arrow, then you may even think that you're more now moving into a, into a, a counterclockwise uh, direction. So this is again ambiguous. So depending on how often you're sampling this movement, you may get a correct depiction. So if you're sampling the movement often enough, you, you may get correct information out of it. If your sampling rate is less, you may get ambiguous information. You don't know if it's coming or going. Or if your sampling rate is even less than that, you might get error uh, from your measurement and you may think that the, the direction is, is the opposite. So this is called aliasing. 
And this is happening in pulsed wave Doppler where the Nyquist limit is exceeded. I will explain. Each ultrasound system, each transducer, will have a capability of measuring your Doppler shift. And each frequency on each ultrasound probe will have a maximal Doppler shift that it can measure. This depends on your transducer frequency and it also depends on depth of that sample volume. If you want to uh, display the information unambiguously, then you'll have to sample at least twice a cycle. In the uppermost image, we have a continuous wave Doppler measurement. There is a continuous measurement, so you have exact information on everything that's happening. If you drop your sampling rate, some rate somewhat, so you're taking measurements along the um, waveform, not continuously, but often enough, you're going to have a very good idea about what's happening. The direction, the intensity, and all, all those things will be measured quite well. When you're measuring twice per cycle, you're still getting enough information. So this is the minimum you need to do to determine amplitude as well as uh, frequency. Because if you don't measure twice per cycle, so see in the bottom image, they are only measuring these little dots here. And when you connect uh, these measurements, you may erroneously think that um, your frequency is much less than it actually is. This is the importance in sampling at least twice per cycle, at least twice per cycle. And that is the detectable Doppler shift that you're, that you're measuring. So there is a maximum detectable Doppler shift that you can measure based on your transducer frequency, the depth, and then as we talked about it, um, the pulse repetition period always depends on depth how deep you're going to put your sample volume. So let's do a quick calculation. If your pulse repetition period is 0 0.125 milliseconds, what would be that maximum detectable Doppler shift? As you see here, um, 0 0.000125 seconds is your pulse repetition period. We know that pulse repetition frequency is 1 over PRP, so that's going to be 8000 Hz. And we know that you need to measure at least twice per cycle, so that's your Nyquist limit. So this 4000 Hz, or 4 kilohertz in, in this example, is your Nyquist limit, and that's the maximum detectable Doppler shift. If it's higher than this, you won't be able to, uh, the, the ultrasound machine won't be able to detect it correctly and it won't be able to measure it correctly. So that's why and that's when you're going to get those um, funny looking informations on your screen and the ultrasound machine is just unable to measure Doppler shifts higher than this. And don't, don't worry too much about these equations, but it really all, all makes sense. So I will walk you through this. So we know that the max Doppler shift detectable will be pulse repetition frequency divided by two. So think back to the previous slide. So when your PRF was 8000 Hertz, then uh, the Nyquist limit would be 4000 Hertz. And if you think back to the Doppler equation, and then if it's rearranged to, uh, to try to calculate the velocity of that flow, so you're going to need uh, the velocity or speed of sound in that particular tissue. You need the Doppler shift 
you need your transducer frequency and then you're going to introduce the incident angle and the cosine of that incident angle. So now we're going to just combine these first two equations. That's your Doppler shift. We're going to replace that with PRF per 2. So you're going to get your V max. This is just really com a combination of the first two equations. And since we already described that the pulse repetition frequency depends on speed of sound in that tissue and the depth, how, how deep you go. Again, we're going to replace that into this equation. So in the end, we're going to come to this equation where the maximum detectable velocity will depend on speed of sound in that tissue, which is a given, so we can't really change that. The transducer frequency cosine of that incident angle and the depth of your sample volume or the depth of the, of the screen. So again, so this is the important bit. Um, the initial transducer frequency is very important as well as imaging depth. And as you see, there is an inverse uh, relationship between velocity and then the transducer frequency and depth. So the lower the, the depth and the lower the initial transducer frequency, the higher the velocities can be measured. Let's see how does that relate to an everyday example. So let's try to calculate the maximum detectable velocity with pulse wave Doppler. So let's keep our transducer, uh, the sample volume at 10 centimeters. So that's a given, we're not going to change that. And we're going to compare two different probes. So we're going to compare a low frequency probe with 2 megahertz and a higher frequency probe with 5 megahertz. Just using all these equations, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but you can check yourself that the 2 MHz lower frequency probe will be able to measure a higher velocity and the high frequency probe will be able to measure only will be able to measure a lower velocity. So this is what the ultrasound probe frequency has a, as an effect on your detectable Doppler shift and your measurable velocities. Let's calculate the opposite now. So we're going to keep our probe frequency at 3 megahertz, but now we're going to change our sample volume. So let's place the sample volume at 10 centimeters deep and then twice that at 20 centimeters deep. So you see that the, the shallower the depth, the higher the velocities that you can measure. And if your image imaging depth is really very um, is greater, then you, you won't be able to measure that higher velocity. So these are the basis of, or basics of image optimization as well. And that's why I said previously that almost in any image, you should reduce your depth or decrease your depth. It helps with image quality, you're getting a higher frame rate, uh, you're going to get better measurement with the pulsed wave Doppler. So in all modalities, really, it really helps if you're optimizing your image in terms of depth and try not to waste any of your screen with information you're not interested in. So let's go back to this image that I showed you previously. This is when you exceed that Nyquist limit. So the ultrasound machine doesn't really know what's happening. So your sample volume is here. But as you see, um, there's quite a lot of depth here behind that you, you, you're not really interested in. So you can change all of that by reducing the depth. So the phenomenon that's happening here is called wraparound that the ultrasound machine is, is kind of not 
are unable to make sense of the returning Im information and it's going to place the missing piece of this over to the other side of the graph. So this is just the ultrasound machine misinterpreting that returning information and this is called the wraparound phenomenon. When is it happening? If your pulse repetition frequency is more than two pulses per beat, then you're going to get your no normal information depicted in a correct way. If your pulse repetition frequency is less than two pulses per beat, that's when it's happening, the aliasing and the wraparound, that's when the information will be depicted in an incorrect way and that's just the ultrasound machine is unable to make sense of that returning information. How can you avoid alley aliasing? Just referring back to those equations and calculations that we just did, you can choose a lower transducer frequency. Larger ultrasound machines are capable of changing the probe frequency, so you can use and, and select a lower transducer frequency. You can shift the baseline in that image using a larger area for that one direction that you're interested in. Reducing the depth is always a good idea, and as a general advice, reducing the depth always helps with image quality. And then if you know where that flow is originating from, then you can change to continuous wave instead of pulsed wave Doppler because as if you think back with continuous wave you're gonna lose your range specificity but if you're actually interested in the flow velocity and not so much where it's exactly coming from then continuous wave Doppler is a good modality. All right let's move on to tissue Doppler imaging. Tissue Doppler imaging is using the same principles as the pulsed wave Doppler. However, the filters in this one are set for much slower velocities, so less than 20 centimeters per sec as compared with meters per sec velocities, and for much higher amplitudes. It can be combined with M mode or 2D imaging. And this is the image that you're getting with that. So if you're combining your tissue Doppler imaging with M mode, then you'll you can imagine that for this RVS prime or the, or the sorry for the TAPSI measurement for the um, right ventricle, reds are always towards the probe and blues are away from the probe. So you're getting information about the myocardium, what the myocardium is doing and what that tricuspid annulus is doing uh, throughout the cardiac cycle. And if you relate that to your ECG, see how you can make sense that systole, uh, the heart is moving towards your probe and in diastole, the heart is moving away from your probe. And then you can do your measurements. When you're using tissue Doppler and you'd like to um, check myocardial velocities or um, annular mitral annular velocities then you can use your sample volume and again you can see the color coding in this so blue away red towards and then you're going to get a spectral Doppler display from this location where you placed your pulse wave sample volume and then you can infer all sorts of informations from the spectral display. All right let's move on to color flow imaging and again for color flow imaging the principles of the pulsed wave Doppler are used. So all the advantages and disadvantages of pulsed wave Doppler we will experience in color flow imaging as well. You can think of color flow imaging as multiple scan lines 
at the same time with multiple sample volumes placed on these multiple scan lines as you see here on the image and then you check the velocity or actually the change in velocity as compared to the previous frame and then when you measured all these velocities in all these individual sample volumes you will assign a color to this depending on the direction and hues different hues of that of, of, that, of those colors depending on uh, the, the intensity and then inside the color box these pixels these colorful pixels will be depicted and they will show what direction the flow is going and what intensity and sometimes even you can infer the nature of that flow is it laminar is it turbulent even though color flow imaging is based on pulsed wave doppler principles it is a bit more robust and less angle dependent and i think it's more to do with it's a, it's a comparison between frames and what is happening in one frame and then the change from that one frame over to the next frame and information between the two um, however you still need when, when you when you want to measure things you still need to be as parallel to your beam as you can so for example a mitral regurgitant jet a central mitral regurgitant jet you can see it in an in a parasternal long axis view of the left ventricle um, we know that uh, the direction of the ultrasound probe is 90 degrees uh, into that beam into that jet however you still see uh, the mitral regurgitant jet when you want to measure it you need to move into the uh, apical four chamber view though so that your angle of incidence will be more parallel to the direction of flow you need to be aware that when you're using color flow images that will worsen your 2d images so some of your computing power uh, will be used up for these individual little sample volumes and just because you need time for those in for, for that information to come back to your probe so you, your frame rate so your 2d frame rate will drop when you're using a color flow imaging box and the nomenclature be behind color flow imaging so you have your color box which is just the area so you controlling this you how big you set the area on your 2d image where you want to uh, depict color and then when you're using color flow you're using your color scale reds are always towards the probe so anything above the baseline it's red and different hues of red and turning into yellow so that's going to be towards the flow to towards the probe and as you see the different hues and different colors are depicting different velocities and blues are always away from your probe and again so different hues and different colors of blue are used to depict different velocities away from the probe so blue away and red towards and I just put this picture up here to, to tell to say really that blue and red color coding really only exists to tell you what the direction of flow is compared or, or in relation to your ultrasound beam and ultrasound probe so it's in no way describing arterial or venous flows so it's only the flow direction blue away and red towards and when you have a better look at uh, this uh, mitral regurgitant jet here see how uh, the jet changes color 
So this is your Martel Regurgitant jet here. And you see reds and blues and yellows and different hues and shades of blue and all sorts of different colors are coming together. So this is a, a mosaic um, of various different colors. And that's related to the fact that color flow imaging is using the pulsed wave Doppler sim, uh, principles, meaning that there is a limit of what sort of velocities you can measure. And that, again, I would refer back to what we already covered with all those equations and calculations. So the same limit will apply in color flow imaging. There is a maximum velocity that you can measure with color flow imaging. And there's a maximum velocity that you can depict in your color box correctly. If that velocity is exceeding what you can measure, what your maximum measurement can be, then aliasing will occur. So one way of looking at it, so let's see, you're starting from the baseline. So when there's no flow, you're starting from black. And then you start measuring your velocities uh, clockwise here using reds and various different hues of reds and then you reach yellow so see how here yellow is the the uppermost limit of what you can measure in that direction but the flow is higher than that so then the ultrasound machine will borrow some colors from the other side of the spectrum and even though the direction of flow is red, it should be red, it, it should be coming um, towards the probe, it will be depicted as a blue. And the same can happen toward to the other direction as well. So you start measuring uh, the direction away from your probe and you're going and you're going and you're having less and less uh, like a uh, lighter and lighter hues of blues, but then you run out of colors and the velocity is still higher than that. So then the ultrasound machine will borrow uh, some uh, reds to depict this. So even though the flow is going away from your probe, you're gonna get reds to depict it. And if you look at the, the color scale, there's always a number there at the ends of the, the color scale, and that's the highest velocity that can be displayed unambiguously and correctly. And if the velocity of the blood is higher than that, then aliasing will happen, and that's a color change, a shift in color, and that's in the color flow imaging, that's the aliasing instead of wraparound, or, you know, this is a wraparound phenomenon really, so we call that aliasing or color shift. And to summarize it really, so when the flow velocity is higher than your measurable Nyquist limit or um, uh, the Doppler shift really, then in the pulsed wave Doppler you're going to get the wraparound and in the color flow Doppler, you have the color reversal or color shift. And that's just a different way of the ultrasound machine telling you that it's unable to process the information. So it's gonna give you some sort of uh, uh, information that's not really making sense. How can you reduce aliasing? You can change your scale. So you can try to look for um, a wider scale or, or narrower for that matter, whichever way you want to go. Uh, and another way of doing that is to, to shift your baseline. And we're going to be coming back to this quite a lot when we're going to be talking about hemodynamics and some methods of measuring hemodynamics. And then we're going to be talking about these scale and baseline shifts a lot. Some ultrasound machines have a thing called variance maps. So it means that there'll be other colors assigned to your color scale. 
So not only reds and blues and yellows, but different hues of greens as well, depending on uh, whether any turbulent flow is happening. So when there's a, there's a very much different uh, Doppler shifts coming back from various red cells, meaning that there's various velocities are happening at the same place, so you, you're getting a turbulent flow, those will be depicted as shades of, gr of green. And on the screen, you're going to get this green as, a, as, a, as, as an indication of turbulent flow. So that's just another way of, of telling you that turbulent flow is happening. Same principles explained slightly in a different way, showing you the spectral Doppler map and the spectral Doppler display. When you get your aliasing flow and you're unable to measure because that was your measurable limit, then that aliasing flow will be depicted as a green or shades of green, telling you that there's turbulent flow happening in that area. All right, well, thank you for listening and thank you for bearing with me. Very difficult, difficult concepts and not very easy to understand concepts, but I think it's important to spend some time on these and then try to make sense of what sort of information the ultrasound machine is giving you. My sources and resources, some of the images I borrowed from these books, and as always, I would, I would definitely recommend buying these books as a reference and to study from them. I, I keep using these books every day and they're really excellent. So thank you for listening and then I'll see you next time with some new concepts.